Smackdowns the better show, they say. Oh, you can't screw up a Money in the Bank themed pay per view, I said. Ah. <laughs> you want to talk about the epic of epic fails. You want to talk about seeing Raw and the stuff that was Extreme Rules and doubling down and saying, here's money in the bank, straight down your throat and right up your ass. I give you WWE Money in the Bank 2017. And for those of you that are going to comment, hashtag the laugh is real. <laughs> oh my God. I look at it this way. In the rap game, it's one thing if you're a black rapper and the black community loves you and streams your music and, you know, follows you on Twitter and all of this. You've made it to a degree. But where you really make it is when the white suburban kids are bumping your music and saying, fuck the police. That's when you know that you've crossed over. And for professional wrestling shows, similar to when Scott Steiner gives a math lesson or Psycho Sid jumps off of a second rope to deliver a big boot to Seth Scott Steiner at the best of Johnny Ace because he wanted to expand his offensive repertoire in the match. You cross over for something being bad to where it is being so bad that it is epic in its awesomeness and its failure. And sometimes those are the shows that I value. Those are the shows that I treasure. Those are the shows that I love the most. And make no mistake about it, ladies and gentlemen, Money in the Bank 2017 was an epic failure. But it was such an epic failure that I enjoyed it, that I loved it, that I spent three hours laughing, and I can't remember the last time a professional wrestling show had me this amused and this entertained from beginning to end. You enjoy a show the way the hell you want to enjoy it. In this particular case, I got tremendous enjoyment out of it because of the suck that it was. Still doesn't mean I didn't enjoy it. Right now, this is my favorite wrestling pay-per-view of 2017, bar none. You thought Extreme Rules was bad? Oh, baby, let's talk about Money in the Bank. And let's kick right off with the women's Money in the Bank match. Hey, it's cool the ladies can play too, and it made sense to kick off the show with this match. One thing I gotta say, in honor of Father's Day, what I wouldn't have given to have Tamina come out with a microphone in her hand and say, I'm gonna kill a bitch tonight and get away with it. I'm just saying. I'm just saying. And, and honestly, even though I, going into this match, I had no real interest in the women participating. I didn't view any of them as really worthy winners of the Money in the Bank briefcase. I did find myself, as the match was going along, kind of sort of enjoying it. Um, and just at that point where the match was maybe starting to really suck me in. <laughs> WWE gonna WWE, man. And of course, of course. In this modern day and age, with Vince McMahon still calling the shots and running the show, of course a man would end up being the winner of the first women's Money in the Bank ladder match. Of course, with James Ellsworth's help. <laughs> James Ellsworth dropped the briefcase down to Carmella. <laughs> so many people are so pissed. You, you have to take this for what it is. Just high fucking comedy. Get over the piss part and just enjoy it for the fuck you eat that this finish generated that really helped set the tone for the screwy what the fuck night that we ultimately got. This was awesome and it only got better. The Tag Team Championship, New Day, Usos. At this point, I don't care, give any fucks about either one of these teams or any of the participants in the match. Um, I'd be much more entertained if we played another Xavier Woods sex tape than I would watching these two teams wrestle. However, as the match went along again, I was finding that I was enjoying it. That these guys were no selling the shit, they were doing all types of crazy crap. I, I ended up caring about it quite a bit. And I was looking forward to the finish. And then WWE, gonna WWE, they gave us the finish because ultimately... Why decide something at pay-per-view being when you got to build up to the SmackDown Live rematch? 
<laughs> using pay-per-views and special events and using the WWE Network to set up to your live TV show on Tuesday night. <laughs> That's called getting your WCW on, boys. That's good shit. That's good shit. Hashtag long live Bischoff. Hashtag long live Russo. <laughs> so we were two for two with the squirrely shit. Oh, but wait, there's more. The women's championship match. I think everybody was pining for Carmella to come out and cash this briefcase in, especially since you had Daniel Bryan and Shane McMahon tweeting after the match talking about how they were going to dress it on SmackDown. So logic would dictate the heel would sit there and have access to Twitter, get word of this, and want to cash in now uh, so they can't take away the briefcase. So that way they got to deal with you as a champion and it makes it a lot harder to strip you as the champion because you could have potentially, in theory, won the championship legitimately. But of course we didn't go there. Now first off, I want to say I hate Naomi's feel the glow stripper gimmick. I feel like, again, I need to go to the ATM and pull out some more money so that way I can get the happy ending while all is said and done. I thought Lana looked all right. You know, it was weird. She really didn't get much of a reaction when she came out, but it's not that weird because people gave a shit about her as a valet, as a manager, not a wrestler. So, of course, you're throwing her in as a wrestler and you're throwing her right into the women's title picture. She was okay at times, sloppy at others. I wonder if that's what Rusev says about their bedroom life. Uh, <laughs> This match was kind of fuckery when all was said and done, and this fuckery was only made more fucked when Carmella and Ellsworth, Carmelsworth came out and then teased like she was going to cash in and then ultimately didn't. It's like, <laughs> what type of heat are you going to generate here? I get that it's heat, but what type of heat? <laughs> Is it heat heat? Is it Xbox heat? <laughs> or get fucking bent heat? And in terms of get fucking bent heat, the WWE was dealing in abundance tonight. Incredible shit. And now you get two, your three matches through the show. You're like, holy shit, we got almost two hours left and we only got two announced matches left. How are they going to fill the time? Well, ta-da, what do you know? It's Mike Bennett and Maria Canellas. The rumors are true, except they're only kind of true because apparently they're Mike and Maria Canellas. That's right. He took her last name. <laughs> He took her last name. Now, God damn it, if, if they don't come out on SmackDown in a couple of weeks and chill for equality with gay adoptions and <laughs> become primary pushers of single-payer health care for all, then I call bullshit on this gimmick. This is fucking awesome. You've made me at a fucking cuckold for, for, for Maria to the point where she's supposed to be some type of motivational speaker or whatever the hell this is supposed to be. And he's all being presented in a way where he's going to legitimately just be trying to set up other people to fuck his wife. Now what I can't wait for, I can't wait for is when Raw decides to counter tomorrow night with the Bray Offerman gimmick, if you know it. <laughs> Maybe SmackDown could form a babyface team of John Bellow. Oh my god. <laughs> the debut was awesome. <laughs> he took her last name. <laughs> because of course he fucking would. The WWE Championship match. I mean, it's cool to see all the legends. You know, it's my yearly reminder that Sergeant Slaughter is still alive. Um, so I pop a little bit for that. I really pop seeing Larry the Accident. He can be very fun. Perrin Von Rashka. Both guys are still alive. They're both cool guys. So I definitely pop for that. Um, as the match is going on, somebody tweeted out there a picture of somebody checking out Jinder's back knee like his glasses are not fucking incredible. And then what the fuck is up with Mike Kyoto sitting there kicking out the Singh brothers? Mike Kyoto, that's racist. Bullshit. And when, when we got to the point where freaking the guys are over there... I love when the same guys go over to all the legends that are staged on the one side. And Ric Flair gets up when they grab Cowboy Bob Orton, which is going to, of course, set Randy Orton off. And Ric Flair gets up and he's like this, and it felt like 80s Dusty Road shit. And Sergeant Slaughter's just sitting there and be like, uh. 
he, he didn't want to miss any part of this train wreck, but he also didn't want to be too closely associated with it. You had to appreciate how Jinder Mahal, the Maharaja, <laughs> sold the RKO like it was a fucking stunner going down to his knees. And it struck me as I was watching this pay-per-view that Jinder Mahal <laughs> is what Billy Jerk Haynes would have been as a heel <laughs> world champion <laughs> if he was a Canadian Indian. Oh my God. And then some people probably thought that Randy Orton was going to win in his hometown with his dad watching and all these legends there. Give me a fucking break. Then, you know, the match was all right for what it was. <laughs> Why change the finish from Backlash? Let's just <laughs> lather, rinse, repeat, Maharaja. All I care about is we need one more match and it needs to be a Punjabi prison match. Period, bitches. <laughs> Breezango. <laughs> whatever the fuck you know I look at the WWE I see so many of these characters now both white and black and I say the WWE is really with their characters modern feminism the women are all masculine and the men are all feminine and if you think about it that's true don't sit there and say hashtag that's sexist it's hashtag feminism because it's true you wonder what the Ascension were up to? Well, they were here at this point in time in the show to give you a few minutes to give you your piss, shit, walk the dog, masturbation break, and you might have been able to fit in a couple of those. Surprise roll up for the wind. I'm sure the soothing solid monster is pleased about this one. Blink and you missed it. Who gives a shit? Oh, it's the Ascension. What are they rising up to do? Who gives a fuck? Next. And then the main event. Oh, the coup de grace of the night. Oh, my God. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I, I thought heading into this pay-per-view, I'm like, the only real option that the WWE had for the women's match was to have Asuka be the surprise six entrant and have her win, and then Nakamura... Be the, be the men's money in the bank winner, have a Japanese invasion, I could have had some Pearl Harbor jokes ready, you know, all this bad, tasteless shit. So the WWE clearly went in a different direction. They decided to have two men win their two money in the bank ladder matches, and... <laughs> so we can't even get through Nakamura's entrance without the lone wolf, Baron Corbin, attacking him from behind. So that way... We can kill the crowd's interest in the match from the very beginning because this was everybody's guy. So let's send him to the backstage for 15 minutes like he's afraid of fucking ladders or something. And the match was shit to start off. And then all of a sudden it goes from absolute crap to fuck you. No matter how much I try to pray the Zane away, you keep trying to tease that he could win this stupid fucking match. To now these guys are just flat out crash test dummy sitting there trying to kill each other and nothing of can you top this high spot. It is just crazy to me. Wrestling used to be you pretended to hurt each other and you made a lot of money. Now, of course, you really do hurt each other and you don't make as much money because, of course, wrestling gonna wrestling, if you know what I mean. But the match picked up and then Nakamura comes out and of course we throw logic to the side when he does finally come out because Corbin's in the ring ball by himself Nakamura's way up there you've got the ladder instead of quickly climbing the ladder and grabbing the briefcase you wait for Nakamura to run down but we found out a little bit later why he maybe wasn't in such a rush to get on top of the ladder you know at one point in time we got the awesome showdown between Nakamura and AJ Styles and that was a bit of a highlight for sure that was definitely a tease of bigger things to come but unfortunately with the the length and severity that these two guys went at each other and how things ended up playing out with the finish of this match, it makes you feel like they're going to dive into this for SummerSlam instead of pumping the brakes and slowly building on this for what it should be, which is a big monster match at WrestleMania. And then, of course, the finish of this match, the finish of all these matches was just squirrely and fucking weird. <laughs> Hashtag Road Dog Rules, yeah! Baron Corbin. <laughs> Collapse the ladder, and he tried. By God, he tried his best, and not just with the balder, taller, somewhat cleaner Ambrose impression that he does, but he tried his best to get on top of that ladder and pull off a jack flare. It didn't take him ninety seconds to two minutes to unhook it, but you can hear the commentators trying to fill. You know, it's not easy to hook. when the guy can't relatively quickly unhook the briefcase, it may potentially be an indication that you have made the wrong decision in terms of who you have selected to win that match. 
instead of giving the people what they wanted in Nakamura, you said, fuck you. Thank you, Bobby. We're going to fucking give you Baron Corbin as your money in the bank winner. Oh, baby. Business is about to pick up. You got Jinder Mahal and Randy Orton in a program. Surely Cena is going to come back and get involved in that business. Hashtag Breakfast Club rules, bitches. And then lurking out of nowhere is the lone wolf Baron Corbin. What's he going to do? Lose more hair on you? Get to think so many knuckleheads have for months tried to assert to me that SmackDown was the superior show to Raw. Well, in terms of show quality, Money in the Bank was every bit the disaster of Extreme Rules and so much more. But the big difference is, and technically I will give you guys credit, SmackDown was better in this sense. That they were able to do what Raw couldn't do with Extreme Rules. That they took something terrible and got it to be so bad to where it crossed over to where it was an epic fail of awesomeness. Extreme Rules tries to save it with having Samoa Joe win the number one contenders match and trying to do business the right way. Well, fuck you. Give me this train wreck of a fucking disaster. Chaka 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 I don't give a damn if you like this show or not, because I most certainly did. I don't give a damn if you don't like why I like this show, <laughs> because I liked it, and I liked it for my reasons, and probably liked it harder than a lot of people that liked it because they actually thought the show was good. You can like something and think it was a fucking disaster. I love train wrecks. I'm a human being. What more are you going to say? I had, I'm the hashtag real heel of this shit. Believe me, this was fucking incredible. This was epic. This was awesome. And this leaves me no choice but to see how the WWE follows up on this disaster come Tuesday on SmackDown Live. Because that's going to be must-see botch television if there ever fucking has been. I wasn't sure a couple of weeks ago whether I was going to watch Money in the Bank or not. I thought about it and I thought about it. And I'm like, I'm going to give him, I'm gonna smack down a chance. I'm going to try. I can't possibly screw Money in the Bank up. I won't possibly leave the night hating that show, will I? Well, I was half right, half wrong. Uh, they did screw Money in the Bank. This show was terrible. It was so terrible that I loved every fucking minute of it. The material it gave me for Twitter throughout the course of the night, the number of laughs and giggles and what the fuck's going on. I can't remember again the last time I enjoyed the WWE pay-per-view this much for my reasons. And those are the only reasons I care about. WWE did a lot with this show to help hashtag make wrestling fun again for this guy right here. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it too. If you didn't, then shit all over to the comments, please. If you enjoyed it for reasons like I did, then share in the comments. Tweet about it. Post on the show's Facebook page. I don't give a shit. But make sure you subscribe or die to this fucking channel. Make sure you tell everybody about this goddamn Money in the Bag 2017 review. The epic fail of awesomeness that this show was. It was like a psycho Sid Big Boot off the second rope <laughs> to the hearts of so many WWE fans on this Sunday night. I love it. <laughs>